Hello. Good, mo good afternoon, everybody. So I am behind the scenes here, um, but I think we are ready to get started. So I will let the two of you take it away. And I think, Brian, you are starting. Yes, I am. Thanks, Laura. Um, and and welcome, welcome to all of our um, participants who joined this webinar. I'm just going to introduce myself and then kick it over to McKinney, our superstar. I'm Ryan Lee James. I am the director of the Rollins Center for Language and Literacy. And I just wanted to join to really welcome all of you and thank you for being here. We're so grateful for your commitment to children and appreciate the time you're investing to improve their experiences and outcomes. I wanna share a little bit with you about how we arrived at this place and offering um, the year long journey. At the Cox campus, we believe that literacy is a means, not an end. Only through literacy can we have a life of self-determination, a future we design for ourselves. When we talk about literacy, we're actually talking about deep literacy or deep reading as doctors Marianne Wolf and Goldie Muhammad define it. Deep literacy or deep reading goes way beyond proficiency. When you're able to read deeply, you're able to think critically, exercise empathy, take the perspectives of others and self-reflect. In this view, reading and writing are more than just skills to be obtained but transformative acts of self and society. Now that you're registered for the year long journey, we will send you updates as each new course is added. We really hope you stick with us throughout the entire year, both for the courses, but also for the community we're building. As we go through the year, we wanna hear from you. That could be thoughts about the course, its impact that it may have on your students and your pedagogy, or just things that you wanna see on Cox campus. It's all fair game. Now, let me introduce to you what we're doing through the year long journey. How did we get here? Why all the buzz around the science of reading? And what does that even mean? Well, the science of reading refers to research and, interdis and interdisciplinary study on how we learn to read. First, we know that reading must be explicitly taught. Why? Because our brains were never wired to read. However, we, our brains are wired to communicate. And so for that reason, we learn language implicitly, not reading. In 2001, the National Reading Panel published their report identifying the five pillars of reading that must be explicitly taught. We have known since then, <clears throat> We have known since then what they are, and yet more than 20 years later, the system continues to fail our children. Nationally, only 35% of our children are reading at proficient level at fourth grade, and this data remains relatively constant through eighth grade and even through 12th grade. So while everyone is talking about a learning slide due to COVID, it is not new. We were already here. Those statistics that I just shared are actually from 2019. But the return to school gives us a chance to do better and to reset. And we're glad to be resetting with you. Through the year long journey, we will break down all the elements of reading instruction into practices that you can apply immediately in your classroom. The coursework is self-paced. We've led with the coursework that you need to begin We've led with the coursework that you need to begin the school year, thinking about the simple view of reading, decoding, times language comprehension equals reading comprehension. We've started with courses that you need to get your students to become skilled decoders, early literacy, and our phonics course, which just launched yesterday. We also have um, our read aloud course for vocabulary and comprehension that is available now on Cox campus and an oral, language an oral language course coming at the beginning of the year. These courses build knowledge and provide evidence-based instructional routines and resources that will, that will support your existing curriculum, making tier one instruction more accessible for all children. So that's enough for me. Every journey begins with the first step and we're so glad you're taking that step with us. McKinney? 
All right, everybody. So taking the next step, we would love to get to know more about you since you've heard about us. And so I would just like to ask you two questions in the chat. And the first one is just to let me know what state you live in. And we are here in Georgia. So if you could just let me know in the chat where you live, and I would love to see that. Okay, I see Florida. Oh, wow, a lot of Georgia. Lots of Georgia. Mississippi. Maryland. Great, great. Oh, New York. I'm originally from New York. Hi, Marjorie. <laughs> so I said we've got lots of people from different places. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Okay, so now I have one more question for you. So on a scale of one to 10, how would you rate your confidence in your current content knowledge you have in practice in early literacy? Because that's what we're going to be talking about all today. So on a scale of one to 10, how confident do you feel in your current knowledge and practice around early literacy? So I see a lot of sevens. I see some eights. Okay, great. Some sixes. All right. So I see that a lot of people here probably like kind of in the middle know, know a lot, but want to know more. So great job. Okay. So, oh, I see somebody said 10, that early literacy is their passion. All right. So no matter where you are on the scale, you know, if you are a new teacher or if you've been doing this for a while, you know, we welcome everyone here. So let's move on. And I want to tell you more about today's session. And so you, if you can go to the next slide. So today's session can also be accessed on Cox campus. So, you know, don't worry if you had to leave early or whatnot, like you can come tell your friends to come back and see this session if you feel that it was good. And on Cox campus, you can find courses, resources, and a community. And this website is free. Okay, and that's due to the support of a generous donor. And we will be posting a link in the comments so that you can go to Cox campus. And hopefully we would love for you to sign up. And you can sign up on, we even have a mobile app that you can sign up on. So you can sign up. It's a, it's a very quick and easy process so that you can get all, have all these free resources at your fingertips. So let's go ahead and move on. And I wanna tell you more about what this specific webinar is gonna be about, this training. And so this training is gonna be about early literacy and we're gonna be just lightly touching on print awareness, phonological awareness and alphabet knowledge. And I would like to know, we're gonna put up a poll question because we would love to know, have you already taken this course? Have you already taken this course on Cox campus? Cause that will kind of let me know um, where we need to go. So. It's just a yes and no. We're going to get and just kind of see the percentages of who has already taken the course or not. I do see some comments in the chat, um, but if we can go ahead and do the, the poll as well so I can get an idea. And I'm not quite sure if the poll is, does anybody, does everybody see the, the poll question, the yes or no? Okay. Oh, there it is. It popped up. Okay. So we have about 25% of people who have, who have seen the course and about 75% who have not been through it. And that's fine again. Okay. Because you could be here and, and I'll be giving some information, but I would love to encourage if you have not taken it or if you're currently finishing it and you did not get a chance to finish to go ahead and take it. Thank you so much. So now let me tell you just a little bit about myself. So I have had 19 years in education. And um, of that 19 years, I have taught kindergarten for seven years and I was an instructional coach for five years. And I've been working at Rollins. This is my sixth year at Rollins uh, Center for Language and Literacy. And I'm currently a content developer, meaning that I've created some of the courses that you have watched on Cox campus, including this one. So welcome, and I'm excited to be with you here today. And I designed this session to be as interactive as possible virtually. And so I'll be calling on you to share ideas in the chat and to partake in several engaging activities. So let's go ahead and get started. 
So I love to start off with the goals of what it is that we want to, by the end of this training, you'll, you would have done. So let's look at that. So by the end of this training, you would have learned the three foundational skills that make up early literacy. You'll understand the difference between phonological awareness and phonemic awareness. You'll learn how to tie meaning into phonological awareness activities. We're going to practice several phonemic awareness skills. You're going to engage in a letter discrimination activity. And then you're going to learn the three phases of letter writing. So let's get pumped up by that. <laughs> okay, and we'll check back at the end that we do those things. So right now I have a reflection question for you. And I would love for you to answer this question in the chat. We are in a safe space. Nobody's going to get you. You can put down your thoughts. I promise that <laughs> I'm not going to bite. So if you can share, what are the earliest skills and abilities do you think children need to help them become successful readers? So again, what are the earliest skills and abilities that you believe children need to help them become successful readers? And go ahead and answer in the chat. Okay, I see phonological awareness. I see vocabulary and phonological awareness, oral language, speaking and listening skills, letter sounds, manipulation of sounds. I see a lot of things around sounds. Great print awareness. All right. All great answers. Okay, well, let's go ahead and move on to the next slide. And to help us answer that question, we're going to go ahead and watch a clip that is actually from the early literacy course. And we need sound on the clip. Have you ever wondered about the earliest skills and abilities children need to help them become successful readers? What are they and why are they important? Hi, I'm McKinney from the Rollins Center for Language and Literacy. At Rollins, we believe that teachers are professionals and it's our mission to ensure that all teachers have access to the science of reading. Today, we're going to explore three different skills that build the foundation for early literacy and future reading success. First, let's talk about Scarborough's reading rope. In this reading model, skillful reading comprehension is a combination of two important components, language comprehension and word recognition. And each of these components is made up of many subskills. So, in order to become skilled readers, children must be proficient in both language comprehension and word recognition skills. In this course, we're going to focus on early literacy skills, starting with print awareness, then move to phonological awareness, and finally discuss alphabet knowledge. All right, guys, so that's exactly what we're going to talk about today. So during this training, we're not going to cover each and every one of the subskills that make up print awareness, phonological awareness, and alphabet knowledge, because we will be here for some time and we only have an hour. But we're going to take a deep dive into about one or two skills in each of those domains. But I will highly encourage you again, if you haven't seen the course, for you to go ahead and watch it and you will see all those skills at play. So let's go ahead and we're going to start with the first domain, which is print awareness. And we can move to the next slide. And print awareness is the knowledge of how print works. And so we can break print awareness into three main categories, book conventions, print conventions, and print functions. And so we're going to just talk more about print conventions right now. And so we're going to watch this clip about print conventions. The knowledge of print conventions includes the knowledge that letters and words are different, the understanding that a sentence ends with a punctuation mark, the knowledge that words make up sentences, the understanding of the relationship between print and illustrations, the ability to track print from left to right and from top to bottom, and many more understandings about text and text features. Let's watch as a teacher models tracking print and directionality with her students using a pointer. So this time, notice how I start at the top and I move from left to right on each line. 
So I'm reading from the top of the page to the bottom. He jumped so high, high, high. high. He reached the sky, 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 and didn't come back, back, back till the 4th of July, July, July. In large text like big books, ink and charts and posters are great to use when teaching print conventions because the words are easy to see and the print features are prominent. You can also touch on print conventions when teaching writing. Watch how this teacher models a return sweep during a shared writing activity. How can we get to and you know what? I ran out of space. What should I do Return if I run out of space? Return. And since I started my title in the middle, I'm going to make sure this last word stays in the middle. How can we get to school? Would you like questions to use when teaching? All right, guys, I'm back. And so I'm just going to give you three tips that you can use some helpful tips when you're teaching print conventions in your classroom. So my first tip is going to be to use big books to draw attention to words and letters because they're easier for kids to see or children to see and interact with. And it makes it easier for you as the teacher to draw attention to letters, words, and punctuation marks within the story. Okay, our second tip is to use highlighter tape. And highlighter tape is great because you can teach print conventions like words in a sentence. One way you can do this with highlighter tape is to ask your children to come up to a, a enlarged text, a big book or a poster, and to underline the words in a sentence and then go back and they can count them to know that words make up sentences and make it more concrete, that concept more concrete. Another way you can use it is when you're teaching uppercase and lowercase letters, you can say, okay, I would like you to go ahead and use this highlighter tape to go ahead and find uh, an uppercase letter. And then follow that up with just, okay, well, why is this letter uppercase, right? Like, so is it because it is a month? Is it the, someone's name? Is it the beginning of a sentence? And then another way you can use highlighter tape is to have your children highlight a, a punctuation mark. So you might have them use the highlighter tape to highlight a question mark and then just don't stop there. And you may follow that up with asking, well, why do we use uh, question marks? So those are all good ways that you can use highlighter tape. And the third tip I'm going to give, and you saw an example of this in the video, is you can have um, use pointers, fun pointers. So you can buy these. And if you don't want to buy them, you can make your own. You see an example there of, of a pointer that has a little googly eye that you can use from popsicle sticks and, and, the, and they can craft them themselves. And those are kind of fun. Um, and so I would love to kind of have just a quick discussion around this and to ask you, what conventions do you think, print conventions do you think would be great to use, to, uh, to use um, a pointer for? And I would like if we can actually come off, if you have a comment, you can either leave a comment in the chat or you can come off a mute and raise your hand and then you can share with us. If you do this in your classroom, like what print conventions do you use? Um, can you use pointers to teach? So again, if you can answer that in the chat or come off uh, of uh, mute and we can have a little quick conversation about that. Let's see. Read the room. Uh, Jessica, would you mind telling us more? If people don't know what read the room is, would you mind coming out <laughs> and telling us? Hey, I'm sorry. Uh, read the room where students uh, can be called on or volunteer mm -hmm. to identify various either letters or words uh, that you're looking for within the room or words that begin maybe if you're working on um, our phonemic awareness or phonological awareness or phonics, depending upon how you want to do it. Um, maybe if you're saying, I'm thinking of a word that starts with the p sound, the child could, you know, find a, a word in the room that starts with the p sound like pencils. Um, okay. So I like that because we can use, like, again, like when we talk about all these domains, 
um, we can even combine the domain. So it's just not just only teaching about print conventions in a big book, but if you did something like read the room and you had them maybe identify a letter, right? Or say what sound that a letter makes, which would be going more into phonics. Let's see. Great. Thank you for sharing. Okay. Someone says, I use the pointer to show tracking left to right, up and down, and use pointers to read predictable pocket chart sentences and poems. All right. Anyone else want to come? One more person want to come out and share with us um, how you use it? Or may use a pointer? Okay. Well, I think there are some great suggestions in, in the chat. And I was going to just reiterate that teaching directionality left to right or up and uh, well, that, or that we read from the top to the bottom is a great way to use uh, pointers. Also, one-to-one -one correspondence when they're actually pointing to each word um, as they read. So great job. Thanks, guys. So we're going to move on. Oh. Mm -hmm. Let me unmute it. Once I put that in there, you guys sent me the thing. I was going to say, once you start introducing it, you can also have the one of the students hold the pointer and point as you read because it's it reinforcing that and um, they're they're able to see it as well. Oh, thank you so much. Tell me your name. Miss um, Frizzell, Angela Frizzell. Oh, all right. Thanks, Angela. Okay. So we're going to move on and now talk about phonological awareness. We kind of talked about it, touched on it um, a little bit, but phonological awareness is the, so our first domain we talked about, let me just recap, our first domain we talked about was print awareness. Now we're going to talk about phonological awareness. And phonological awareness is the ability to detect, identify, and manipulate sound units and phonemes in spoken words. And we can go ahead and kind of categorize phonological awareness, break it up into phonological sensitivity and phonemic awareness. And I'll tell you more about that in the next slide. Okay, so if you look at this graphic, you will see the different levels of phonological awareness. So above each step, you will see something that says like word awareness, syllable awareness, onset rhyme awareness, and then phonemic awareness. And so as you go up those steps, it gets a little bit more difficult for children sometimes to do that skill, okay? And so phonological sensitivity encompasses those first three columns, which is word awareness, syllable awareness, and onset rhyme, onset rhyme awareness. And so those are when you're dealing with larger sound units in words. And the next and the last level is phonemic awareness, where you are actually looking at the individual uh, phonemes in the word, also the smallest units of sound, and that is our ultimate goal. So we're going to go ahead and turn our attention, uh, and let me just give you examples so you know what I'm kind of talking about. So when we're talking about larger sound units, we're talking about kind of like chunks. So for example, if I said the word sun, and I said, can you go ahead and segment that word into an onset and rhyme, I may go, I would, I would go un, and then that like chunk is un, but if I said can you go ahead and segment the word sun into phonemes? Then I would go s, uh, n, and that is all the individual sound units, okay? So we're going from the larger chunks again, that is, excuse me, phonological sensitivity and the smallest units of sound when we're going ahead and doing things with those, that is phonemic awareness. So let's go ahead and talk more about phonemic awareness. So we can group, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> we can, I don't know why Crystal's there, but okay. We can group phonemic awareness skills into two categories, board categories, which is um, advanced and basic. And in today's webinar, we're going to focus on practicing two skills that are in the basic category, which is blending and, and segmentation. And right here on this slide, you can't see it, but on the basic level, there's phoneme isolation, blending, and segmentation. And on the advanced level, there's addition, deletion, and substitution. But right now, you're going to watch a video that is just about uh, blending and segmentation. We're moving on to the next set of phoneme skills. In this step, we'll talk about phoneme blending and phoneme segmentation. Let's start with phoneme blending, which is the ability to verbally blend individual sounds in order to say a whole word. Watch me as I demonstrate. First, I'll blend several phonemes together to make a word. R, a, g, rug, rug. 
Now you give it a try. Blend these phonemes together to make a word. K, l, a, k. If you said clock, you're correct. Did you notice how we're displaying images of the words being blended? This is a simple way to incorporate word meaning into your phonemic awareness instruction. You could do the same thing with picture cards. Let's watch as this teacher works with a small group. We are going to blend some sounds together to make a word. The first sounds, are you ready? M, A, P. What word am I trying to say? Emerson. Map. Map. Absolutely. I use a map if I'm lost. Okay, I've got some more. A, S. What word am I trying to say? Vase. Vase. Right, Harrison. I put the roses in a vase. In this example, the teacher adds in even more meaning to the activity by using the fully blended word in a sentence while showing the picture card. The exact opposite of phoneme blending is phoneme segmentation. It's the ability to verbally segment a word into individual sounds. Watch as I demonstrate with the word pot. Pot. P -a -t. The word pot is made up of three phonemes. Now it's your turn. Segment the word slept into phonemes. How many phonemes did you get? Let's check. Slept. S-l-e-p-t. The word slept is made up of five phonemes. The more phonemes a word has, the more difficult it is to segment. In this example, the word slept has a consonant blend at the beginning and one more at the end. Let's watch a clip with students segmenting a word with a consonant blend. Can you finger stretch the word slash? Slash. Very good. How many sounds did you hear? Four. Good job. Teaching young students to segment each phoneme in words that contain consonant blends is an important level to reach in a student's phonemic awareness development. In the next step, we'll learn about the most challenging phonemic awareness skills. All right, guys, I'm back. So I want to talk to you about something that was in the clip, and it was really like driver's point home, is how you can add meaning to phonological awareness activities. And when I mean meaning, I'm, all, I'm talking about like someone talked about oral language and vocabulary. So you don't have to just sometimes do these skills in isolation without driving like the context of uh, or introducing more vocabulary. So if you can go to the next slide, um, I want you to think about doing this. Cause I know when I was a, a kindergarten teacher, I didn't think about doing this, um, using like sentences to what like, so I might, I might just have in the past, I might have done like a segmentation activity, but, didn't have a follow-up sentence to maybe tell them what the word was that they were segmenting. And I saw, you saw an example how the teacher did that with the word vase. You can also use picture cards so that their kids can kind of get that, um, tie in that meaning to the word, word meaning. And also you can bring in real objects. So like instead of the picture vase, you might have what in a real vase so that they can see it. So I just want you to think about that too. So you can, again, use picture cards, define the word, and then also bring in real objects, okay? So let's go on, and we're going to actually do an activity. So the way this Zoom is in presentation style, you won't be able to have access to the emojis, but what you can do is go ahead and put the number in the chat. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say a word, and I want you to segment that word, and then I want you to write in the chat how many phonemes are in that word phonemes are in that word, okay? So let's do this first word. So the word table, right? Does table have three phonemes, four phonemes, or five phonemes? So I want you to put, and I want you to segment the word table and then put in the chat how many phonemes you think that word has. 
All right, I see a lot of fours. And you'll be correct. Table has four phonemes. So let's, I'm just going to go ahead and do it. Ready? Table. T A B O. Four phonemes. Okay, let's try another word. Shine. How many phonemes does the word shine have? Is it three, four, or five? I see a lot of threes. I'm going to go ahead and do it. Shine. Sh I N. Three. Okay, let's do another one. Broke. Like I broke my glasses, which I used to do a lot when I was a kid. How many phonemes does the word broke have? I see, I see fours. Okay. B -r -o -k. Four. Okay. What about scream? I scream when I see a monster movie. Scream. I see some fives. So I'm going to do scream, sk, r, e, m, five. Okay. One last one. Toys. How many phonemes do you hear in the word toys? All right. Toys. T, oi, s, three. So the O, Y makes one sound, oi, t, oi, s. Okay. All right. So let's go ahead. You did a great job. And let's talk about our last domain. Our last domain is alphabet knowledge. And alphabet knowledge is the knowledge of letter names, letter sound, letter shapes, and letter formation. And we're going to focus in on letter discrimination and letter writing. Okay. So um, I'm going to go ahead and excuse me, define letter discrimination for you. And letter discrimination is the ability to compare and contrast two or more letters based on their physical characteristics, okay? So let's go ahead and look at an example. So I want you to think right here, looking at these two letters, what do you notice about these two letters? How are they the same? And how are they different? Okay. And I want you guys, I want to come off the, um, excuse me, I want you to come off a chat and just tell me how, when you look at these two letters, how do they look the same? How do they look different? What do you notice about them? Anybody want to share? Any raised hands? I see in the chat, I do see in the chat, some people are saying they both have a stick. Okay. They both have a line, only one has an ear. <laughs> okay, they're saying they have two lines. All right, so we can describe the letters to a child with lines, curves, and circles, right? And this really helps our children to discriminate between the letters because there's some letters that have some very similar characteristics and can get confused, but we're gonna to get to that in a second. So let's look at one more example. Okay, what do you notice about these two letters? How are they the same and how are they different? Oh, and, and then again, raise your hand if you, uh, raise your hand if you wanna come off and chat with us. But how are these the same and how are they different? So I see curves. Mm -hmm. They both start off with curves. And how and, and how might they be different from each other? So they're the same, they have curves. The second one has two. I mean, excuse me, the first letter has two. Mm -hmm. And the second one has one. You guys are doing great. Okay, now I said I was going to come to the, now, can anybody guess what my next two letters will be where there's a lot of confusion with kids? Really, there's four, but where might be, what are those, what are those two letters that, the, the B and D, <laughs> B, D, P, and Q, yes, you, you guys know exactly what I was talking about. So, 
I have a little suggestion for teaching children how to distinguish between B and D. And some of you may know it already. And it's called bed. Okay, so we're going to go to the next slide. And let's go to the next slide. Okay, so bed. So when you're talking about this is a mnemonic that kids can use, first of all, with letter discrimination, also with sounds, uh, like letter sound correspondence. Because when you think about a bed, right, you can have the, the head of the bed and the, the, the post, the bottom post of the bed. And then in the word bed, you hear the b sound. And then at the end, you hear, you know, you hear the, the, the sound for D. So even though, but even still, when you're talking about letter discrimination, this will help children sometimes when they are also going to write so that they can see, okay, the B, because when you put your finger down on the paper, that's this, this, the curve is on the side for the B and then the D, the same thing. So go ahead and um Use that in your classroom if you don't know about it. I thought that was a great thing when um, I learned and it really helped a lot of my kids to distinguish between B and D. Okay, so let's move on to letter writing. And this is another skill. We talked about letter formation and letter writing is a skill within alphabet knowledge. And this is the ability to form and write letters. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna watch a video about letter writing instruction. And in it, I want you to pay attention to when, excuse me, when we talk about the three instructional phases, because when I watched this, I thought this was just very insightful. And as you watch, we're gonna have, we're gonna come off the mic to have a quick discussion about your key takeaways from this video, okay? Oh, and also, let me just say that B&D poster, um, we have just finished our phonics course. I meant to do the plug for that too. Is that, um, and that poster is in there and you can get it from our phonics course. Okay, so let's watch this video about letter writing instruction. You are about to hear from Yasmeen. She's an occupational therapist from the Atlanta Speech School and she's going to share some insights with us. Starting with what teachers need to know about letter writing. What teachers need to know about letter formation is that there's actually a lot to know. That kids need to be very explicitly taught before they can develop automaticity and legibility with their handwriting. And they need lots of opportunities for multi-sensory instruction. Like you can write in shaving cream, you can write in sand, write with chalk, write with markers, write with crayons. Also that the, the way that you actually form the letters is important because if they establish very poor letter formation habits, sometimes an A can look like an O or an R can look like an N. And once those patterns are established, it's very hard to go back and correct them. So they need lots of opportunity for multi-sensory exposure to the way you form letters and repetition, and also to make it super fun so that it's, you know, engaging and something that a kid wants to do. That's great advice, Yasmeen. Now let's find out what are some common misconceptions about letter writing. Some of the misconceptions that teachers, I think, often have about letter formation are that it's something that kids come in with knowledge about or they have mastery of rather but there's a very specific sequence for ac acquisition of handwriting and letter formation so kids have to learn to by imitation first and then they can copy with a model and then that's when independent writing comes along so there's three stages imitation copy and independent writing and i think that's one of the biggest parts of um challenge for teachers when it comes to the mystery of handwriting. So if you really understand that, you can kind of structure the way that you to present information and lessons to children um, with that in mind. So if you have a child that might need imitation, you would know that you're going to have to sit there and show them how to write a letter first before that they before they actually are able to, to write something. Because oftentimes I see teachers maybe in a kindergarten classroom and 
they will have a very long, relatively complex for kindergarten sentence up on the board for a child to write. And they might um, still be in the phase where they're in, Im Im the, in the imitation phase. So to expect copying when they're still needing to see how the letters are written, then that presents a bit of a problem. Let's watch as she demonstrates going through the three stages. Okay, let's do some lowercase letters. First, I'm gonna have you imitate lowercase letter M, okay? So I'm gonna show you how to do it in my lines, and then you can do it in your lines down here, okay? Okay, so lowercase M starts on the top line. It dives down, swims up and around, up and around. You try there, start on the top line. Dive down, swim up and around, up and around, perfection. Okay, now I'm gonna have you copy it. So I want you to close your eyes and you can't watch me make this letter this time, okay? I'll tell you when to open. Okay, same letter, but you get to copy it without watching me do it. Can you make that M starting at the top? Perfect! I didn't even have to tell you! Okay, help me erase this. Bloop, 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 bloop. No. no. <laughs> you want to keep it as clean as possible? Okay, now I want you just to make an M all by yourself. Don't forget to start at the top, though. Here's, here are your lines. Oh, I'm only going to give you one set of lines since I'm not going to show you this time. Okay, let me see your M. Good job! You imitated, you copied, and then you wrote it all by yourself. Very insightful. I wonder how Yasmin's students have responded to this type of instruction. Let's find out. Some of the things I notice about my students after we teach in this multi-sensory um, fashion with lots of repetition is that it becomes a lot more automatic for them. And then oftentimes kids might have some issues with integration. Like for example, if they are having to figure out the phonics piece of, of written expression while they're writing something, then the handwriting will fall by the wayside if that's not solidly established. So it kind of, if they have developed a lot of automaticity with handwriting and really have mastered the, the motor patterns for letters, then when they have to do higher level writing and written expression, it frees up some of the brain space, you know, to, to focus that energy towards the higher level sort of uh, demands. Thanks for sharing with us, Yasmin. Now, let's learn about five things you can do in your classroom to become more effective when teaching letter formation and writing. All right, guys, we are back. And I would love to know- You are about to hear from Yasmin. Okay. <laughs> and I would love to know any key, oh, can we go to the next slide? The one before that. Yes. Okay. I would love to know what's one key insight or takeaway that you got from this video. And I would love for us to actually discuss this one because I know there were some big takeaways for me, even when I was creating um, the course to learn about. Well, I'm not going to talk about my key. I want to know about yours. What, what, what were your key takeaways that you got from watching that video? Do we have any hands raised? Anyone want to talk? Okay, I still see some things in the chat, so. Oh, okay, someone said, I realize I'm headed in the right direction. Can you tell me more about that? Um, Lagretta, can you tell me more? How do you know you're headed in the right direction? Oh, okay, I see, sure. Can someone get her off on it? Um, so we can hear her. Hi, what I what I, I've realized that I'm headed in the right direction because these are the things that I've actually started this year, my students, because I'm you I have pre-K four students. And now I've just been doing a whole lot of using a highlighter, having them to write over the highlighter. Mm -hmm. 
having them to write over top of what I'm doing. Right. Uh, one, right. Young, one young man, I realized, is ready to move forward. <laughs> so I was able to take him and have write it on top, have right. him imitate what I was doing. And then I had him to do it on his own. And sometimes you're not always sure, I oh, man, is that, you know, is that good? But seeing this now and seeing the video, I'm saying to myself, okay, great. Right. I'm, I'm, I'm moving in the right direction. <laughs> right. I love it because I'm going to be honest with you. I know when I first started teaching kindergarten, that's not, well, you know, even teaching writing was not really a, a big topic of discussion. It was kind of like, well, just have them to write. And so even when I was going through this, and I'm, I even think about um, some of my family members at home, like they, you know, just they immediately bring out the paper and pencil you know, for uh, one of my nieces to write. And I was like, hold up, wait a second. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> let, me, <laughs> let me let me show you this. And I just don't, you know, I, I was, I really love this step, you know, in this course, because I think it really is very insightful. Anyone else uh, yeah. want to? Yeah, go ahead. go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I just think it's very powerful um, for me, like I said, because I have pre-K-4 students mm -hmm. and they're not always ready or holding the pencil correctly, yeah. you know, they don't have that three-point grip yet, mm -hmm. just to be able to do that. And they're, wa they're watching me. And mm -hmm. I, just t I just told my parent, I'm going to get some cool whip tomorrow and, mm -hmm. use, and use this step on their desk. Yeah. So well, thank you so much for sharing. I appreciate thank you. that. Anyone else? Oh, I see Ayana has her hand raised. Ayana? Yes, you can also use foil because okay. I, I don't do you know, sand because I don't have enough sand for everybody. So I found this, got this idea. You can take aluminum foil. I, I got the little sheets from the like the dollar store mm -hmm. and you just ball, you just ball it up just barely. Mm -hmm. And then you can make the lines and they can write. And when they write, they actually have to really pay attention to mm -hmm. see the letter formation. Mm -hmm. And to erase it, you just ball the foil back up and the letter erases. Oh, okay. I never thought about that. So thanks so yeah. much. Yeah, that aluminum foil works, works really, really well. And they really, really love it. So we've oh, been doing nice. aluminum foil. Nice. Because I know a lot of times, you know, it's hard sometimes to find the sand. And then I know some people like, you know, it makes a lot of, you know, the, uh, the cleanup. So that's a good, that's a great idea too. Thank you so much for sharing. Okay. I see. So oh, someone has used flour. Okay. Anyone else want to share before we move on about anything, any big takeaways they got from that step? I mean, excuse me, from that video. Oh, Kimberly said, can you explain that one more time about the foil? Yes. Yes, I'll be happy to. I guess okay. I actually got the idea from, um, I brought it from another teacher. Okay. But you get the aluminum foil. I get the sheets. I get it from the Dollar Tree where you have the sheets and you take a sheet. When you, when you ball it up, but not too much, you just take it and you crumple it up. They can actually write anything on it. Mm -hmm. And then to erase it, you just spread it back out. You just put your hand on it. Once you, I actually... No, I don't have any, or I would actually, I can't show you right now. But you ball it up, you write the letter on it, and then you can use that same foil over and over again. Mm -hmm. So once you get it, you have to really see it because once you ball it up and it has, like you can't write on it when it's just flat. Right, right. And then you'll be able to see it, just write a letter on it. And what I love about it is they have to really concentrate because if you don't press down hard enough when you write the letters or a word, you can't see them. Mm -hmm. So then the letter comes out smooth. Just imagine you've got the balled up paper and the letter is coming out smooth or the word that you're writing on the foil is coming out sm smooth. It's really good. You don't have to I worry can... about the sand. <laughs> <laughs> I know, look, being honest, I know a lot of people like, oh, that sand, <laughs> clean up. So I think that's a good idea too. <laughs> and, and also I know the shaving cream, you know, that cleans the desk afterwards. So it's so... <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay, so let's go ahead and talk about our goals again. Let's revisit our goals. So we said that we were going to learn about the three foundational skills that make up early literacy. We did that, right? Phonological awareness, print awareness, alphabet knowledge. 
We said we were going to understand the difference between phonological awareness and phonemic awareness. And remember what that is, is phonological awareness is made up of phonemic awareness and phonological sensitivity. Phonological sensitivity are the bigger sound chunks and phonemic awareness is the individual smallest units of sound. We were going to learn how to tie meaning into phonological awareness activities. So we talked about adding pictures, adding real objects, and we talked about adding sentences to add meaning. We practiced several phonemic awareness skills. We practiced phonemic segmentation and you saw blending. We were gonna engage in a letter discrimination activity. And so that was the activity where we talked about comparing like what looks the same, what looks different. And then we just finished up learning about the three phases of letter writing. So I would love for you guys to do a Wordle. Right now, there's gonna be a link in the chat. Um, and I want you to use one word, write one word in the, in the, in the link that which you get and describe how you are feeling about the information that was shared today. So just some feedback for us about how do you feel about, how you feeling now about the information we shared today. Oh, thank you guys. I see confident, grateful, excited. I see this in the chat. Exci oh, great. I'm, I'm glad, you, you know, I already know that it's hard sometimes to come into a Zoom meeting, virtual meeting, so <laughs> I tried to make this as engaging as I could for you guys, um, inspired, thank you, great comments. Um, thanks, guys. I'm glad that you feel that way. All right, so we're going to move on, and I'm just going to give you some next steps. All right. So for our next steps, I just want to talk a little bit more about Cox Campus because I want to leave a little bit of room for some questioning. So I'm just going to um, talk about Cox Campus for a bit. So Cox Campus offers multiple K-3 courses like we talked about before and extensive resource of a uh, library of resources and some useful coaching tools. And we have an active community. Um, that we share, like, you know, you could talk about questions, answer questions on our discussion board. And that I mentioned before, it's free, right? Okay. So you can earn, hey, wait, I forgot to say this. I don't know if I said this before. You can earn professional development credit uh, for Bright from the Star and from ISS. So when you take our courses, you can also earn credits. All right. So I also want to share, like, one of our, like, what about, what one of our discussion boards looks like. So if we can show the next slide. Okay, so this is what one of our discussion boards looks like. So for example, this is a question like, how would you integrate activities from our quick brain breaks into your lessons? So in the actual course, the early literacy course, there's a resource that gives ideas for quick brain breaks, how to tie those three domains into brain breaks. And then like you can see here, like uh, we have teachers already discussing and talking to each other about the different kind of things they do. Somebody said, we use the color of children's clothing in their preschool area. Uh, somebody was saying they love the mystery bag idea that was shared in the course. So just to show that we have a community here where you can talk to other teachers and give ideas. All right, and I wanna tell you about our next session that will be coming up next month. Um, and it's gonna be about phonics, about our new course that's coming up. So. Uh, October 28th, same time, 3 p.m., uh, this will be a, a new facilitator, but they will be talking about systematic and explicit phonics instruction. And that course is up now. So if you want to get prepared and watch that course before that session, that would be wonderful. All right. And I would love to know from a poll, how did we do? So please use, okay, so the webinar poll, is the link is coming up. And we would love to know, uh, just, if you could just answer these questions. The first question is, if you haven't taken this course, do you plan to take it in the near future? Yes, no, I've already taken it. And did this session help to deepen your knowledge? And this is in the poll. So I would love it if you could just take a couple of minutes to just answer the poll questions. Be honest. Be honest.
All right. Oh, I'm happy to see all these. Yes. Okay. Plan on taking it. Thank you. Yes. It is a great course. Um, so does the full course go more in depth? Yes. Okay. So in this webinar, I couldn't even cover all of the skills that are in the course. So for example, like for phonological awareness, like we only talked about phoneme segmentation. Like there, there's a lot of phoneme skills. Like there's phoneme um, manipulation skills. Like, and then in the course, it gives an example of how to do it. You get to practice it. And then all of, for each one, you get to see it in the classroom too. So not just like me talking about it, but you get to see a teacher doing it in the classroom. Okay, let me look at these results real quick. Okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. Yes. All right. Does this session deepen your knowledge? All right. Thank you, guys. Okay. So if you have any questions now, I think we have three minutes and I want to respect your time. Drop it in the chat and I will see to answering it. Oh, and this, this is our little wordle that we did. If you didn't answer in the chat, then you can go ahead and, oh, I'm sorry and see some things of how people felt about the course. But yeah, let me, I'm looking for questions now. Let's see. Is there a way we could spread this course out over time? I would love, yeah, you can take it as you, so our courses, you can take it as you go along. So there's no like time limit to it. So you can spread it out however you would like to spread it out. I would suggest if you were going over it with someone like to take a domain at a time, so like the, the, the lesson, the course is broken up in lessons and steps. So I believe there are, it's either five or six lessons and then each lesson has a couple of steps. So I would just take a lesson at a time if you were going to use it over um, with your teachers, if you're, you know, training your teachers, or even if you're a teacher by yourself, like don't watch it all at one time, let it soak in and do it over time. Uh, let me see, looking at any other questions. Oh, you guys are welcome. Yes, exactly as Laura said, it's a two and a half hour course that can be broken up in smaller lessons. Any other questions? Let's see. I'm scrolling. I'm scrolling. Okay, so somebody says, so the benefit of this session like today is that we can talk and interact in real time. Yes, that is one of the benefits of this uh, session and so that you can actually practice and then we can uh, have like a real live conversations and then also like make other references for example like the thing with bed wasn't in my course but it was in another course but I thought that was important to like pull out and then getting ideas from other teachers because I would have never thought about the foil that was a great idea like I would have uh, that's not in the course I would never thought about that so yes it is for us to engage with each other all right, you are ex is yes. Okay. Any other questions? Is in the course online, do y'all cover syllabus? Yes, that is in the phonics course. Yes, Kimberly, the advanced topics. Yes, that is in the phonics course. This course was more geared towards um, kindergarten, first grade teachers. Um, but of course, if you have older kids that still need you know, you, you differentiate your instruction based off of the assessment. We have an assessment course and you, there are older kids that may need some instruction in phonological awareness still, you know, so yeah. Oh, no problem. If you have a lot of questions, that's no problem. <laughs> I have a lot of questions too sometimes, don't worry. Okay, so it's four o'clock and I said, I want to respect your time. So thank you for joining us. You have all the links. This will be this will be uh, on Cox campus as well. Um, so if you have friends that you want to watch it, if you want to watch it again, if you want to use it in some kind of PD, you can. All right. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Kimberly. Thanks, Abigail. Thanks, Cheryl. All right.